my colleagues, and can I welcome uh, members of the press and public to the ninth meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, can I first of all ask all those present to ensure that their electronic items are switched to flight mode uh, so they do not affect the work of the committee. I have apologies from Drew Smith. Uh, colleagues, can I take us to agenda item number one? Uh, and the question is that we should take agenda items number three, four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Okay. Uh, it's to agenda item number two, uh, which is the section 22 report, the 2013-14 audit of NHS Highland uh, Financial Management. Uh, we'd like to welcome Elaine Mead, the Chief Executive of NHS Highland, Gary Coots, uh, the Chair of NHS Highland, and Nick Kenton, the Director of Finance uh, of NHS Highland. Highland. Koska just advises that this is our second evidence session with NHS Highland on this report, following on from our meeting in Inverness on the 2nd of February. Uh, I would therefore propose that we move straight to questions. Uh, can I ask uh, members and witnesses to keep uh, their questions brief, uh, both uh, the questions uh, and those uh, answers at the same time? Uh, I would uh, also uh, be grateful for colleagues could direct their questions to the specific witnesses that are before us uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, can I, uh, Ms Mead, firstly, uh, on the issue of brokerage, which we've had some previous discussions and in respect of quite detailed discussions in respect to that, but I think it would be helpful for uh, the official report today and following on from our meeting uh, in February in Inverness, just for you to give us some background to what exactly brokerage is uh, once again. So brokerage... Um is an ability then, if we agree with the Scottish Government, to take some additional resources to allow the organisation to break even at the year end. And that was the situation for us. Um, we required at the year end £2.5 million of brokerage, which amounted to 0.3 of a percent, in order to ensure that NHS Highland broke even financially. OK, so can, can I just can I clarify then... Brokerage is effectively an additional lending facility provided by the Scottish Government. It is, and it, we are required, of course, to pay that back in, in okay. subsequent years. OK. And it's a significant uh, decision have to be taken by your organisation, which you're the accountable officer for. It absolutely is. It's not something we would wish to do or would do lightly, um, but it is something that is available to us in agreement only with the Scottish Government. OK. So can I give you an analogy, then? Uh, you know, people go through the process of additional lending probably almost every day, and as we speak, there will be additional lending taking place throughout the world for that matter. So it's a significant decision that people have to take. Uh, so the autonomy of those decisions that are taken and those whom they take them in partnership with have to be kept informed of those decisions. So, you know, in clear terms, can you lay out what the process is for your organisation, because you're effectively you're accountable to your quasi-judicial board, the Quango, uh, health board that you're responsible to, is that correct? Absolutely. So we would be monitoring the financial position throughout the year in NHS Highland and we report that formally um, to a number of committees, but the most important one, of course, would be to the board. Um, the board then would be very aware of our financial position and the decisions that we were making as a, an executive and management team throughout the year. And the board would be giving me guidance as accountable officer on the actions they wished me to pursue. When it came to the end of the year and it became apparent... Want to, in respect to that, okay. what I want to clarify is, firstly, the process that you would follow for that and who is responsible for it. So can you confirm how many board members you have? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. 13? It's a, a, it's a board of about 22, of which there's a mixture of executive, non-executive and stakeholders. All of those individuals have a responsibility for the decisions taken by the board, am I correct? Indeed. Yeah. But so, as the accountable officer, I have that ultimate responsibility to Parliament for the decisions that yeah. are made around finance. Yeah. But they have to be informed of the, the decisions that are taken that respect, in respect to financial decisions, don't they? They do. Yeah. So in respect to this additional lending facility, which is effectively brokerage, then they would expect to be informed of this, wouldn't they? So they would, in a formal manner, so they would expect to be absolutely clear that they have taken on the responsibility of additional lending to the Scottish Government, because they have significant responsibilities as board members, don't they? They do. And so they, they can't be kept in the dark. They've got to know 
that when a decision is taken that they are ultimately responsible for, then you have a responsibility to report that to them, don't you? So, as the accountable officer, I have the responsibility, but absolutely I have the responsibility of reporting that to the board. And we reported to the board... No, I understand you have the responsibility to report it to them, mm -hmm. but they then have the responsibility to take the decision to apply for that additional lending, don't they? The standing financial instructions are, are silent on that. So, the, it is not clear that it is the board in total, the accountable officer having been guided by the board to take all action required to break even, was my responsibility and my decision to secure the brokerage. So, so just to clarify, so you're saying now, and we didn't, I don't think we quite got to this stage previously, that position's silent on that, but you accepted also in the last session in Inverness that you accepted the 22, Section 22 report, uh, which the Auditor General submitted to us, where they advised us that the reason for you applying for additional brokerage was because of issues relating to the financial management and the financial reporting to the board. Indeed. Is that that's correct? And that you is accepted correct. that in your previous evidence? We absolutely accepted that. I absolutely accepted that. So whilst you advise us that the rules on this appear to be silent, the reason why uh, we're in this position is because the board weren't made aware of this. So, so they could have been taking decisions across the board, not knowing uh, that they'd already submitted themselves to a lending facility that you hadn't informed them of? I informed the chairman immediately. We'd but I'm not talking about... Decision. I'm not interested in the chairman. What I'm interested in, I put myself in position. I am a board member on your board, and I'm taking decisions every single day uh, relating to the financial management of your organisation. For me to do that, you need to make sure that I'm constantly informed of the position on a daily... and at least the cycle of the meeting papers that I put before me. Um, that didn't happen, so that had consequences then, didn't it? We did keep the board informed, and the board gave me clear instruction to take whatever action was necessary in order to break even. And it was on that mandate I made the decision to request brokerage and secure brokerage from the Scottish Government. Yeah, I understand you said you've done that, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the position you follow, but you do appreciate the impact that this could have had in the decision-making process of your board members. Uh, for them to be in a position to be able to take decisions at the board, surely they have to be informed properly through the board paper process. Is that not correct? It is, but it's my belief and understanding from board members they were fully informed and quite clear about the action that I would be required to take. So, so the board members felt fully informed? Yes. So they were quite happy that you had decided to take on the brokerage uh, uh, responsibility, despite the fact that they weren't informed. I, uh, but, uh, well, despite the fact that you, effectively you've signed up a lending facility, which I, I, I mean, I don't know what, you, you mean, obviously you've had corporate experience elsewhere. There's not many businesses across whatever sector it is who would really think it's acceptable for somebody to take a significant decision like this without them having the sign-off process to do that. It's pretty unacceptable and it's very unusual, is it not? These were unusual circumstances for NHS Highland. It, we had never required to secure brokerage before. Um, on reflection, I would accept the point that you're making, Mr Martin, but it may have been better for us to have an additional board discussion, but... My feeling at the time and still today is that we had had a number of discussions with the board and the board were quite clear in their mandate to me, which was a requirement to break even. And in fact, we were on track to deliver break even without brokerage up until month 10. So can I just ask finally before we move, mm -hmm. move on to other members of questions to ask? Now, I've looked at your board papers for other issues that you've taken decisions on. I mean, you know, some of them relate to a wide range of issues relating to the management of your board on a daily basis. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could probably find something in here that tells us how many paper clips you've bought and you know, many other procurement processes that you've went through. So there's other elements of your business strategy or your business decisions that are taken every day that you have reported to the board that, to me, are important, but nowhere near as important as somebody in the board being advised, yes, we've now taken on an additional lending facility. And um, listen, you're responsible for that. 
And we did report that to the board. But After the decision was taken. I'm absolutely accepting yeah. that, but we had had a mandate from the board in order to secure financial break-even. And so, at so that can, point, can, there can was clarify no what the mandate, what, what do you mean by mandate? The board had requested that I did everything that we ne was necessary in order to break even. So you got a blank cheque? So they just says, go and do whatever you need to do. Go and get whatever loan you want to get. They, so they, they, so they, they, did they really just say then if the loan was for, for £12 million, then it doesn't matter, just do whatever you have to do to break even? Is that what they said? No, they didn't. They were quite clear on the scale and they were quite clear on the actions that we were taking. And the alternative actions that would be necessary should we not secure brokerage. But, but it was quite... I mean, were you not surprised, though, when the board said that to you? Just go and do whatever you want to do. You know, you're the chief executive, go and do whatever you want. Did you not say to them, well, you've got some governance responsibilities here? And my view was that they were ex executing that governance responsibility by v keeping very clear to the position and discussing with us the action they wish me to take. Okay, I'll pass you on to Mary Scanlon. It's, it's just on, on that very point. I mean, the one thing that Audit Scotland, and in particular this committee, are absolutely 100% about is an audit trail. And we've looked at that in colleges and uh, various other sectors. And it's a very serious uh, cause of concern. So the 3rd of March paper, you're talking about breaking even. That's what the board members got. On the 6th of March, you confirm agreement with the Scottish Government. And then on the 1st of April, you don't, according to your audit, and these are papers we didn't have in Inverness, you do not ask the board to agree to a loan of two and a half million from the Scottish Government. You ask them to note the loan. So talking about members being kept in the dark, whatever informal arrangements or discussions you had, the audit trail says that your board members, non-executive directors, were kept in the dark. And that's a serious concern in terms of audit. So I, again, I say the proof we have here, 3rd of March, no mention of brokerage, talking about you know, reducing costs for depreciation and asset lives, etc. Uh, the 6th of March, agreement with the Scottish Government, so you obviously were doing all this behind the board members' back, telling them they would break even, but behind their back, negotiating a loan. And on the 1st of April, noting. I, 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 find, that, I find that a matter of serious concern, <laughs> given the amount of audit reports that we look at at this committee. Um, as a local member, I'm concerned, but if I take it in the grand scale of all the audit reports we get, this is a matter of very serious concern that you are not including the non-executive board members in the decisions. And I am concerned about uh, your response to the convener, that this was all your decision. Um, so perhaps you would like to explain 3rd of March why you told board members you were likely to break even. Three days later, the loan was confirmed. And on the 1st of April, you ask them to note. To me, that's rather disrespectful to your board members. Can you uh, comment on that? I can, Ms Gallon, and, and agree on reflection. Actually, it was remiss of me to ask the board to note. That was unacceptable. We should have asked them for their um, clear understanding and agreement for the brokerage. Should you have not asked them for their agreement before you sought the brokerage, the loan, which was agreed on the 6th of March, rather than asking them to agree to a loan you already had in your pocket by the 1st of April? I understood I had that uh, permission from the board. There's but... nothing in audit. We have nothing to say you had permission. Indeed. And because of that, I would agree with you that um, it would have been better on reflection for us to have asked for that absolute agreement from the board. Where is the, sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, my previous question still stand. Where is the audit trail of the agreement that you sought, the formal agreement with your non 22 non-executive board directors of NHS Highland? Where is the audit trail of their agreement to this loan from the government? 
due to poor financial management. So the poor financial management that you refer to, Ms Scanlon, only became apparent to us on the 18th of February. So this was when the month 10 position was actually published and we saw that the plan was then off track. Up until that point, we had been rightly point, pointing out to the board that although things would be difficult to, to deliver a break-even, we were confident we were able to do that. It was only on the 18th of February where we saw there was some deterioration of the expected improvement position in Ragmore Hospital, plus, as you've already mentioned, an issue around um, some additional funding for asset lives, that then meant that the likelihood of us being able to break even, in my view, was diminishing. And at that point, we were discussing that both informally with board members and formally um, at the formal board meeting. So at every formal board meeting, we've had a report that's described our, our position and the risks attached to it, although you're quite right to point out our report said that our expectation was that we would break even. So the 18th of February, you knew you were going to have to seek a loan from the government, but on the 3rd of March, the board members agree to this paper that we have in front of us, that they're going to break even, and on the 6th of March, you confirm brokerage. To me, that is not about keeping board members informed. The audit trail does not show that these board members were kept informed. So why, why is there no audit, audit trail? That would help you enormously in these circumstances. And we've reflected on that from the Section 22 report, and we've now made the informal discussions that we're having with the board now noted and minuted, so in the future there will be an audit trail of those discussions. So I completely accept the point that's been made that while we were having informal discussions, and I was taking guidance from the board in those informal discussions, we did not have an audit trail of those, and, and we've now moved to put that audit trail in place. So basically what we have, the board members and the general public in Highland think NHS Highland is breaking even. That's the public face of NHS Highland. The private face, which we don't know if board members were aware of, is that you're doing backroom deals or seeking loans from the Scottish Government. The and ask, then asking them to note, which is really the final insult to so your the, board members. The public face was in line with our expectations that we would break even. Well, no, I'm sorry. You said on the 18th of February you had serious concerns. Indeed. So you go and talk to the Scottish Government, but you don't tell your board members that you're negotiating deals. You're telling us here that you're th expecting to break even whilst at the same time asking for brokerage behind your non-executive board members' back. That's, that's our concern. I it's the whole governance concern. issue. I understand your concern and have understand that that may be how it is perceived. Um, well, I can it, it's, not how, it, it's a fact. It's, bring us the audit trail that shows the discussion. It's not here. There was it's not no my perception. This is a fact. Convener, can I just clarify a point here? Is that possible? Yeah. Um, just regarding the 3rd, the 3rd of March, I think the paper you're referring to went to the Improvement Committee, um, and it, from memory it did say at the end of the paper there was still £2.9 million to identify, and it said we were in discussion with colleagues at the Scottish Government about how to manage that. So at the time there were discussions, those discussions weren't concluded, and we said it set out in that paper that we were in discussion with the, um, with the Ooh, Scottish Government, but I think we'd accept it could have been clearer. You're talking about improvements to be made to break even in that right. paper. Yes. Thank you. If the ability to obtain a loan was part of the options presented to board members as a matter of course? Not as a um, matter of course, Mr Scott. That's, as I said already, it's not something we would do lightly and it's not something that... Um, we wish to do in that financial year, um, but board members would be aware because a number of other boards had secured brokerage in the past that that may be an option available to us. But the, um, as Mr Kent has just said, um, they were told that you were in discussions with the government, but they weren't told what, those, what mechanism those discussions would potentially use to fill the deficit. 
No, and at that point we weren't clear what options might be available to us. There were, there were a number. But board members are presumably having, as you said earlier on, never having used brokerage in the past, never having used the loan mm -hmm. facility in the past, because brokerage is a very misleading word, and never having used the, the loan facility in the past, the um, board members might quite, um, I suppose, fairly assume they would just get a bung from the government, in other words, a grant that would just buy off the deficit, because that's what's happened in other board areas, right? Um, they, they may have they may have assumed that. So would it not have been a bit of a shock to the board members that suddenly they'd, as, as Mrs Scanlon has been pointing out, suddenly were asked to note a, a, a new loan, which they'd never been told about before? Were they not shocked? No, I don't believe they were shocked. They thought it was okay to have a loan as opposed to having a grant that therefore they wouldn't have to pay back. Did any of them ask whether the loan would have, what the repayment um, characteristics of the loan would be? We, we made that clear to the board that there would be a requirement for repayment over a period of three years. And did, uh, when you discussed it with the government, did, they, did you discuss with them the possibility of just getting a straight grant rather than a, a loan? Um, I can't recall. I don't think that option was available. No. From who? From which? Did you ask, for a, did you ask for, a, for a grant, for a straight additional amount of funding just to cover off the deficit? No, we did not because we know that's not the way the government would have would operate um, the brokerage system is fairly well a fairly well trodden path brokerage is offered but only on the understanding it would pay back and on the understanding there's a clear plan to enable it, it to be paid back okay um, what are the I wonder if I could ask the chairman what the circumstances would be for calling a special board meeting I mean does it have to be well uh, the circumstances would have to be that we would have the time to be able to do it between, uh, because we have to give board members to clear weeks notice that there's going to be a special board meeting called and so from the time that uh, uh, the, the decision to have the meeting uh, would, it would have to be a substantial time from then until our next scheduled meeting to make it worthwhile as there was from the time of the agreement with brokerage the time that we had our meeting and it was reported was little more than the fortnight anyway so um, I would not have deemed it as uh, appropriate or adding value to have uh, to, to have done that. Um, so you don't have a facility just to basically call a like any normal board running any company I've ever been involved with, they need to get the board together, they just get them together. You don't have that facility. Uh, we can do that informally, and yes, I will do a phone around of board members, yeah. but I've got members that are living in Argyll on islands, uh, and uh, they're part-time. Uh, I've only got use of their time for maybe a day a week uh, for a variety of stuff. So actually to get them together for a formal board meeting to make a formal decision uh, without giving them the appropriate notice could actually have been seen as not giving them the opportunity. I, mean, I understand to all those practical things. things but I, I, I undoubtedly regularly contact board members as issues are arising so that they're aware of them. But I can't call that as a formal board meeting and you certainly won't have an audit trail for it. Are you not allowed to have a board meeting that, for example, allows people to video conference in or use a we, telephone on a desk? We can do that, yes. Yeah. But again, uh, I, I would have to... Uh, you know, in light of the discussion that we're having here and the importance that is being uh, put on this, I, I may well have taken a different view. Mm -hmm. But I was certainly aware of... Uh, this, this was the first time in the... Uh, 10, 11 years that I chaired NHS Highland that brokerage was an issue for us but I had been aware of it being an issue for other boards and I was not aware of uh, uh, the requirement for formal board meetings to take place to allow that to, to happen. Boards are not allowed to run a deficit so we know that our chief executive and others sure. will be looking for any uh, measure to make sure that we break even. Okay, um, just... Uh, in terms of special board meetings, mm -hmm. have you ever held one before? Um, we actually held one uh, to do with uh, the new build proposals for a hospital to allow us to get into... But we knew that, that was, the requirement for that was coming up uh, several months in advance, so we were able to schedule it and have it in. So in terms of formal board meetings, I think that's the... Uh, so we, we've got the facility, we can do it, but it's something we'll use very lightly. So, so, so for a new build facility, you called the special board meeting for that? Yeah. So how long did that take you to call? It would have been the full fortnight. Sorry? It would have been the fortnight's notice that people would have needed. 
The reason it was called as a special board meeting is that it's a complex deal between private sector lenders and Hubco, etc., and it has to be signed off at, could, uh, at the same time as other boards, and it didn't fit in with our cycle of meetings. So we had to call a special board meeting to do that. Okay, sorry. One final question, if I may, convener to the chairman. Um, I think uh, I'm fair, right in saying, Mr. Coots, that you said in Inverness in evidence that there was a board development session at which one member of your board asked whether it would be sensible to look at brokerage, to look at the lending facility. Can you recall what the date of that board development uh, session was? I think that was November, December? Fourth of March. Fourth of March. Fourth of March, sorry. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Colin Keir, what's to come in on the issue of brokerage? Well, it was actually, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, something that was said by Ms Mead in, in terms of the uh, informal meetings. I just would like to uh, clarify that that's okay. Um, and it was the, if somebody was looking for decisions in, of board meetings, and you've been talking about other things in, through an informal basis, how... How can this possibly look correct when you're taking uh, these decisions in uh, informal meetings? How could it be possibly reported for somebody checking up on the performance and anything else that they may wish to check through in an informal setting? If you haven't been taking the minutes at these meetings, formal minutes, and certainly not bringing through that information in full as done at that informal meeting to the board, the full board formal meeting. And I'm really concerned about the fact that the accountability aspect is not really um, clear for the public at this minute in time for anyone who is looking through this. Now, I know it's been mentioned, there's been various things said, but how do people, how can people possibly be sure that this uh, organisation that you lead is reporting in a clear manner, if you're using that type of system. If we can keep questions brief and answers, please. Uh, so, I beg your pardon. So, Mr. Kay, I think um, we've accepted that criticism <coughs> that was highlighted in the section 22, and I think people could now be assured um, mm -hmm. on the audit trail and the level of information and detailed minutes that we keep, both from the formal board meetings and the various committees, for example, the Improvement Committee, but probably more importantly, the informal discussions that we have with the board. So those now are um, minuted and they would be available for people to see as part of an audit trail in the future. I'll, I'll come back to my other question later. Stuart McNall. Thank you, Convener. It's really just you know, one point of uh, clarification for me. Um, so just in, in terms of the major financial decisions, which clearly uh, the brokerage issue is, uh, was it common practice in NHS Highland for these major financial decisions to be, uh, to be discussed um, informally uh, and also without the, the audit trail that we've currently held? Now, bearing in mind the comments from Mr Coots a moment ago that uh, many stated that boards are not allowed to run deficits. So, Mr McMillan, the, um, we'd never had to make that decision to seek brokerage before, but we... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm not just focusing upon the brokerage, sorry. but just any major financial decision. So, we discuss regularly with our board um, any issues of, of financial um, significance, so we would have that discussion formally and informally at the both the improvement committees, we have partnership meetings um, for the Northern Highland area and the Argyll and Butte committee. So the financial position is scrutinised, I would say, quite closely by board members. And that's whether those are revenue consequences or we have a separate capital group that looks at the capital consequences. So Every month we've sent and continue to send a um, detailed report pack to every board member so they would be able to not only see the detail of, of our financial position but we would also then go through that with them um, in informal session but also in, in our formal board meetings. I wonder if I can just clarify uh, just something about the way the board operates. Obviously we're a very large organisation, budget of 736 million and the way it works is through a system of delegated authority. So the board will delegate authority to offices 
take, to take decisions throughout the year because it's, it's, you know, it's not feasible for the board to be taking every decision. So at the beginning of the year, we'll set a financial plan for revenue, which, which is day-to-day -day budgets and capital for the big spend, and officers go away, manage that, and report back to the board every month. So I think it's worth just clarifying that board members don't routinely take this, the financial decisions directly, but they monitor the overall position which has been delegated to officers. No, certainly, I mean, I'm not suggesting uh, for one minute that the board um, should be monitoring every single financial decision. But something as major as, as what we're discussing today, and as certainly what this committee has discussed in the past, uh, that that's the kind of point I'm trying to get to here, is in terms of uh, would, it, would it have been a common uh, thing for a common position for the board to not be fully involved and to not be fully informed uh, when uh, any decisions such as this example or potentially others uh, of, a, of a great significance actually had to happen. The board was fully informed. Um, but the, the issue is that the decision was not taken formally at a board meeting. Uh, and in hindsight, I, will, I want to, to, to speak to colleagues around that, and we will just to, 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 to make sure that can happen. We believed uh, that because of our inability to carry a deficit, that we were the absolute requirement to, to break even, looking at all options, and that we knew that one of those options was brokerage, um, that we were, uh, the board were well cited, that that would have been one of the options we looked at. In light of the Section 22 report, we will amend the way that we work, and I can assure you that if, and I hope it will never happen again, that we require brokerage, that we will deal with things in, uh, uh, differently. But the routine way of making decisions, every decision is made in public. Informal meetings are about information, about briefings, about uh, development so that we understand com the complex system we're managing. It is not about decision making and there has been no decisions made by board in secret meetings. Okay, thank you. So, it's just on that point, it would have been very helpful and perhaps you, know, you wouldn't have needed to be here had the decisions been made in public also been audited in public. What we have in front of us, and I appreciate what you're saying going forward and that's welcome, but what we have in front of us is you're going to break even on the 3rd of March, we confirm a loan on the 6th of March and you're asked to note the loan on the 1st of April. So I take what you say about in public, but what we need and what Audit Scotland needs is con and the general public, given the amount of taxpayers' money that's spent, we need an audit trail and that's just not here. You, and uh, we've given you the assurance that we've taken on board the lesson from that year. That uh, so the lesson has been learnt. Uh, but this circumstance of getting brokerage is something that, in my experience of over ten years, we've never been through before. I thought it was absolutely transparent uh, because it is a routine way of ensuring that you break even. That brokerage is available, and it, when it's uh, it was taken, it was reported to the board. Uh, you, you certainly would not have found, as was suggested earlier, that board members would have been surprised by that because they were well aware that that was one of the options that would inevitably have been uh, looked at. But that's not recorded I agree with there. you. I agree with you. So, so, so can I just and I've apologised for that yeah. and have said that we will make sure that that uh, circumstance will not happen again. Yeah. Can, can I just ask, so before we move on from the issue of brokerage, mm -hmm. so, when you talked about the makeup of your board that's made up of non-executive directors and executive directors, mm -hmm. so there are those who would be heads of departments, I would take it, who are members of the board? Not really so, heads of departments. So directors, sorry. They're directors, yeah. they're executive directors, yeah. yeah. So for them, I mean, and some of them would be leading up some of these organisations who have been going through an overspend as part of the... Uh, we'd have had the chief operating officer who has got responsibility for all of the operating divisions. But, but, but the individual operating division managers, no. But so, so not some of them... I mean, I suppose the point I'm trying to get to here is that those who are attending the board would be taking some decisions within their own departments in terms of how they spend money, is that not correct? The Chief Operating Officer principally, yeah. yes, yeah. along with uh, support from corporate colleagues, yes. So for them to be aware of the fact that, listen, this is getting pretty serious now and the board is taking a decision about brokerage effectively an additional lending facility, that could have an impact on some of the decisions that they then take, could it not? Uh, the seriousness of the issue was absolutely crystal clear to everybody oh. around the board table. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Uh, and brokerage actually relieved the seriousness of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. It prevented us from having to take actions yeah. Yeah. which might have had more of an impact on patients and people that we uh, the, the, care for. The, the, so it, yeah, it the helped. seriousness of it is well versed yes. in that, and we've talked about that before. But I suppose the point I'm making is, is that for those people who are sitting around that table, uh, you know, for them, information being fed to them that, listen, we've just taken a decision on brokerage makes it even more serious than it was before, does it not? They never sat around that board table having had a decision about brokerage without it being reported to them. Because the yeah, they, got it, they got it reported, but if they were part of a proper yeah. process that followed that up, then the point I'm making is it just the whole organisation then becomes aware yeah. of its serious, but it's went to red yeah. alert because now we're asking Scottish Government for money. I agree with you, and yeah. I, I, I think we could do that better and that is one of the lessons that we've learned and we'll certainly uh, ensure that that doesn't happen again but I can absolutely categorically say that there would have been nobody at any operational management level that was not aware of the seriousness of the situation and the measures that we were having to take to secure break-even uh, at the uh, financial balance at the end of the year and they'd have been aware that there would have been a number of other discussions taking place which might have led to a, a solution including brokerage. Combiti. Thank you. Peter. Um, let me start by just one small positive statement, uh, which is that, <laughs> which is that uh, I noticed that uh, Audit Scotland found in its latest financial management uh, review of NHS Highland that NHS Highland made good progress during 2014-15 in improving the financial management arrangements. Having said that, of course, Audit looks backward. Uh, at events that have already happened, and I'd like to look a little bit around the issues around the hospital at Regmore. The main issue that was identified was that there was a, a strong culture of there was not a strong culture of tight financial management, mainly because the, the hospital had had enough money. Now, presumably, it had enough money because that money was getting taken from elsewhere. You had a programme whereby you were. You were uh, making savings in other areas within NHS Highland. Did, that, did the money having to be diverted to Regmore Hospital affect the patient experience in any other areas? So, Mr Beattie, the, um, the issue at Regmore and their financial position had um, been in place for, for a number of years, and, and the having enough money refers to the fact that we took a decision to rebase the budget in Ragmore and in, in effect we wiped off their, um, their budget deficit with an additional £5 million as they went into the year starting 12-13. But that was because of uh, poor financial management? No. You were, uh, were subsidising them? Well, at that point, we, we were persuaded that actually there were increased pressures. So, so we had controls in place at that point. And this is very early on. Um, but in so does that relate back to poor financial reporting? The poor reporting is referring actually to 13-14 to and in 12-13. So this was over a period of years, but the, the, the important point for me is that we did rebase that budget to give that organisation or that part of the organisation the best possible chance of, of continuing to break even with the pressures that it was describing it was facing. It was therefore then very disappointing to us that at the end of 12-13 it was already um, describing, even though the budget had been rebased, a £2 million overspend, and that deteriorated over the next financial year, the year in question 13-14. And that was where there was poor financial reporting throughout 12, 13, but into 13-14, and some um, lack of budgetary control as outlined in the audit, internal audit report and subsequently in Section 22. So we talk about poor financial reporting, but Surely that reflects also in poor management of the hospital. Indeed. Surely, surely, surely that, that, that is the bottom line. Yes, these are challenging um, circumstances, but we did require then the, the hospital um, to deliver a break-even budget we'd asked for, but we'd also ask them to look at a recovery plan 
and the board and the improvement committee and in fact the audit committee were all looking at the outcomes of the internal audit report and the financial recovery plan put in place in Ragmore. And in, um, early in the year, in 2013-14, the then Director of Operations and the Head of Finance were reporting positive progress. But if the management was poor then, has the management changed or is it still the same management? The management has now changed. So we the management have, has changed. We have a different and a new Director of Operations and a different... Um, arrangement to cover the head of finance position. Now you touched on the 2013 review and I would quote, this was requested after a year or two by the Director of Finance. Why? Why did it take a year or two to notice that there was, there was, there was a problem? We, we were taking all measures that we could, so those would have been local measures um, to oversee, support, train, individuals within the organisation, but we weren't seeing the benefits that we expected. And, and we had to question then, and I've described already, whether actually um, we weren't right, whether there wasn't enough resource in that part of the organisation, given the pressures put upon it from other parts of the organisation creating the, the demand, um, which is why we took a, a quite unusual decision to rebase the budget. Having done that, we would have expected the, the budget to be in control. Um, but clearly over 13, 14, um, it deteriorated further even than it had in 12, 13. So, so what, why was it that the, the progress in implementing the recommendations in the 2013 and 14 internal audit reports, why, why was that slowed down? Why, why did that happen? I don't believe it was slowed down. I think we were um, pursuing actions with the, with the local team. And we were seeking and being given assurance that actions were being taken. Some of the um, actions we understood to have been taken, uh, in fact, did not materialise, and we found there were further deterioration of the position. As I, I've described to you, it became apparent to us the, um, the scale of the, the position in month 10 in 13-14, when by that time we had a new management team looking at the financial position. Can you remind me what the overspend at the hospital for 2014-15 is supposed to do? I think it was forecast to overspend 7.8 million. In, sorry, which year? 2014-15. So we had a... Uh, so I'm not, don't recognise that figure, to be honest. The, the target for Raidmore in 2014-15 no, was to overspend by 6 million. 6 million? Yes. I mean, that... how, how robust are the plans you've actually got in place for Raidmore Hospital? So we're now very confident, Mr Beattie, that the, the plans are robust. In fact, we've seen in, in the last financial year, 14-15, that you refer to, um, an improvement in their position, although we'd uh, task them to reduce the deficit by £3 million. They were just short of that and, in fact, had made great inroads into reconfiguring their services and taking um, waste out of the system, reducing some of the demand, but also transforming the way they're delivering services. So their reliance on additional um, supplementary staff had reduced and they were making significant impact into how they were addressing some of the other pressures they'd experienced in year. As at the moment, the, we've obviously had a couple of audit reports which have come forward with recommendations and that's apart from uh, Audit Scotland. How many of these uh, recommendations are still outstanding? and how many have been actually completed? So a number of them have been completed, but there are some multifactorial and rather complex uh, issues that were identified within the um, audit reports, which are, are yet not completely complete, can, but can they have been... Can you give an example? Um, we've, we've done the straightforward things the, around um, training of staff, budgetary control, where we've been looking at um, responsibilities for budget managers. I wonder if I yeah. ask Nick for any more detail. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean, broadly, there's two types of recommendations. There's ones around controls, and, and I think those are either complete or almost complete. But one of the recommendations, for example, was to return to financial balance in Raidmore. Now, clearly, that's not going to happen overnight, so that st stands as, as an incomplete recommendation. It will be until Raidmore returns to balance, which is going to be two years' time. Another recommendation was around a complete uh, review of all the services Raidmore provides. Again, that's not a simple thing that you can do within the hospital. It involves the whole of NHS Highland and, in fact, beyond NHS Highland's borders. So the recommendations 
carried a huge range, and the ones which are fairly simple are either done or almost done. The ones which are more complicated are in, are in there's a plan to, to complete them, but they're not yet complete. What, uh, I talked before about the savings that were made elsewhere in order to compensate for Regmore Hospital. Where about were the bulk of these savings made in order to channel money into Regmore? So we, we looked across the, the whole of the organisation. We were trying to reduce costs um, in any areas that we possibly could, and we were um, ensuring that any additional resources were targeted to where the biggest pressures were. So, um, for example, around supplementary staffing, we would be looking to reduce costs overall across the organisation. Some of those would have benefited um, the overall position, across Highland, um, but we were trying to do that focusing on, on quality and without detriment wherever we possibly could to, to our other services. We've always looked at central services. We've reduced, we've exceeded the target for making savings within the central core of our every, every year. Uh, we'll also look at things like smarter procurement, getting things uh, 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 bought at a cheaper price. So there's a whole range of things that we look at. Uh, it's not just around direct services, but any area that uh, was looking as, uh, to achieve underspends, then that would be applied to rate more. Mm. How satisfied are you, in fact, can you give a guarantee that any future increases in overspending at Rig Rigmore Hospital will be quickly identified and quickly addressed? Because clearly this is not going to go away over the next year or two. I can give an assurance that we're um, comfortable with the management arrangements in Rigmore at the moment, and we have uh, arrangements in place for that regular reporting both locally and through to the Highland Health and Social Care Partnership and to the board. So I think things would be very quickly identified and we could take remedial action um, in a timely way. Nigel Don is a brief question before I bring in Tavish Scott. Thank you very much. Convener and good, good morning colleagues. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if I could go back and this is on the same issue of course I could go back to the point that was made about your senior management being well aware at the end of the previous financial year of the implications. If I might just quote back you what we were told in Inverness by Chris Brown this is column 39 an addition a bit of additional activity was commissioned internally in the hospital right at the end of the year without a recognition of the financial implication of that decision the financial implication came through the following month, etc. Is that right? And are you confident that that would not now happen again? Yes, I believe that, that Ms. Brown was quite right there. The, um, the point that I've alluded to already is that additional work in the form of waiting list initiative work, which would have been paid at premium rate, had been commissioned by the local management team. Um, the costs for that were not um, clear to us until um, the January position where there was a £400,000 adverse movement in, in month 10 due to those waiting list initiative payments. So that, that was of concern to us and in fact that contributed to our need to secure brokerage at year end. Could I, could I, is it possible to clarify something just to say at, at the time those decisions were made by um, individual managers within Raymore, whereas now they're made by the Raymore senior management team, so there's more control and visibility of, of, around decisions of, around waiting list uh, initiative payments. Uh, I'm sure everybody will be very comforted by that thought, the idea that you can just make a decision which runs to hundreds of thousands without people understanding the implication uh, worries us a great deal as parliamentarians, never mind what committee we're sitting on. Um, it's good to know that wouldn't happen again. Davis Scott. Yeah, thank you. Can I just ask a couple of supplementary questions to Colin Beatty's um, questioning on Rig Moore? Uh, the Director of Finance said Rig Moore is going to overspend by £6 million in the 14 15 financial year. Is that correct? That was the target. That's just, so is it going to hit the target? It's or is gonna, it too early to say? It's, no, it's, it's resulted in £6.9 million pounds overspent. Yeah. And, uh, but, so is it routine for Rig Moore Hospital to overspend? To, to... Well, as, as Ms. Mead said, we rebased Rig Moore for. Um, for the year 2012-13 uh, and that year overspent by 1.9 million and it's yeah. overspent since, since that year. So it has overspent the budget that you've given it every year? For, for the last three or four years. The last three, and before and since you had to rebase it in 2012-13 I'm making an assumption there was an overspend in previous years as well. 
Yes, it was rebased because the overspending the previous year was over four million, I think. And, and that's very fair. And when you benchmark that against other hospitals, is that a routine thing that happens in NHS audit and NHS budgeting, that a hospital like Rigmore routinely overspends its budget? I think when we've actually done benchmarking with Rigmore in terms of costs, it's, it's comparable with other acute hospitals. Yeah. And I think if you looked at other NHS uh, uh, organisations, financial reports, you do find the acute sector is always the one which takes the brunt of the cost pressure. And by acute sector, you mean hospitals? Hospital I mean, sector, sorry, in, yes. in terms of hospitals? Yes. Okay. Uh, and is there, is there therefore, do we just accept that? I mean, do you accept as a management team and as a board, is it just part of running the NHS that the hospital, in this case Rigmore, routinely overspends by one or up to your point this morning, six point something million pounds? No, no I don't think we accept that, which is why we've got a three-year target to return Rigmore to balance, but it's, it's Hard, you know, it's hard work. It's a very difficult and complex area to return to balance. We probably spend more time discussing how we can relieve pressure in the acute sector than we do in anything else. You know, it is about making sure that admissions are appropriate, that people are discharged timely, that we're freeing up capacity in the hospital to deal with the people yeah. that require acute uh, care. So it, it is a huge amount of focus for not just for NHS Highland, but across the NHS. I'm sure, that's true. And in the context of running the budget for the for NHS Highland as a whole, do you and have you in the past made an allowance uh, for the working financial assumption that Rigmore will be over its budget by some amount? We did in, in the last financial year, as Mr Kenton's described, so um, that expectation of overspend of £6 million was actually bringing the overspend in Ragmore down from 9.6 million the previous year so we'd expected them to improve and we'd budgeted for that across the organisation. We're expecting an additional recovery in the next financial year and a return to balance the year after. That, that's fine but, but presumably the logic of that also means that as my colleague's been asking that has implications for other areas of spending because you have to make that assumption about an overspend in one part of the operation you can't spend as much money as you no doubt you're under pressure to do in, in other areas of, of activity. Indeed and, yeah. and it's looking at the whole system as we mm. were attempting to describe um, Ragmore is as a result of the demand placed upon it sure. by other parts of the yeah. sector. No, okay, thank you. Mary Scanlon. Yes, uh, I can just follow up. My question is for Gary Coots, um, the chairman, and it's a follow-up to Colin Beatty's point on uh, Rig Moore. Um, you did say that uh, you found savings at Rig Moore of three million, which is half of the overspend. And uh, as one of the local members um, here, you'll understand, and I know you're fully aware, of the concerns elsewhere in Highland, uh, not taken into account at Guyland Butte, but in particular Sky, uh, also Fort William and Caithness. But Sky, in particular, people around Portree with the redesign of the services, they are concerned that uh, the savings at Rigmore will be to the detriment of local staff and local services elsewhere in the Highlands, and I would be failing in my duty if I didn't. I know it's a huge challenge. You are the most rural health board in the whole of Scotland, but uh, uh, I think Ragmore has to be the, the centre of excellence and the centre of specialism. I know how valued it is in the Highlands, but nobody would want that to the detriment of poetry Caithness and indeed Fort William. So I just, just wonder if you could take the opportunity on the record to make sure that you will be looking at the efficiencies within Ragmore. We will still have that centre of excellence, but it will not be detrimental to areas such as Portree and Skye. Of course, Ragmore is a centre of excellence. It will be, remain a centre of excellence. And that is a centre of excellence for people in Skye, as well as Caithness, as well as the folk that live around Inverness. <laughs> The redesign proposals which we're working through at the moment in relation to uh, North Sky and there's still a lot of work to be done with local people and the local clinicians to finally uh, decide on the, the exact way that those services will be configured will not be a cost saving. They will improve the quality of the service that we get, give to people. They will change the way that that service works. But this, these are being driven by a desire to improve the quality of provision um, and providing the correct facilities for our staff to work in and for patients to be able to get the care they need. They are not a cost-driven exercise. Well, given that half of the savings in your response to Colin Beattie, half of the £6 million deficit came from within Rake Moore, 
can you give a guarantee that no, none of the rural services and the rural hospitals will be affected detrimentally in order to reduce the deficit at Raidmore? NHS Highland, when we're looking at savings and efficiencies, has a set of principles that we work to, and that the top of the list is uh, safety. We will not compromise safety. And below that is uh, access and patient experience. And we want to enhance all of those things. Now, it's a really, really complicated system that we manage, as I know you know very, very well, Mary. Um, you know, so somebody might want to have a service very locally, but it's actually safer and better to provide that service elsewhere. And that's a balance that we've got to, to strike all the time. Um, and we need to work that through with local clinicians and local communities. Uh, I I can give you an absolute assurance that NHS Highland is committed to its quality approach and that we will use that as the benchmark when we're looking at savings. We will use that as the benchmark when we're looking at redesign of services uh, and patients and the people who rely on our services will always be at the centre of what we do. Well, I'm glad you appreciate uh, the concerns of the Absolutely. people on Sky, and I think they're not unreasonable. My next question is to Nick Kenton. Um, Nick, what is the level of non-recurring savings expected in this uh, recent financial year 2014-15 and how does that compare with the level predicted by the board's delivery plan? Um, well, uh, if we just look back at the trend in 12-13, our non-recurring savings were 55% of the total. In 13-14, 62% and in 14-15, we reduced it to 60%. So we're heading in the right direction by reducing our reliance on non-recurring savings. And what we've also done is reduced our underlying deficit, which is in simple terms, the gap between your ongoing income and your ongoing spend, we've reduced that down from 7.8 million in 2013-14 to 5.6 million heading into the new financial Sorry, year. you spoke rather quickly there, and you're Sorry. a wee bit far away from the microphone, okay. and maybe my hearing is not as good as it used to be, but uh, could you perhaps tell me what the non-recurring deficit is now? It's heading into 2015-16, it's now 5.6 million against a target of 6 million, so it's lower than our target position. Which is and have you met your target for re reducing non-recurring deficit yes. in 2014-15? Yes. Uh, so that um, takes me on to, I, Colin Beattie was also uh, generous enough to mention that uh, you know, uh, the news from the most recent year, uh, and I've, I take what you say about transparency and keeping board members in the loop. However, I have to say the papers I've got today that I'm still a wee bit confused, and if I'm confused, I'm sure others are. Uh, the first paper is from uh, uh, the first paper is from Elaine, and it's dated 20th April. Subject to audit, NHS Highland has delivered a break-even for 2014-15. So you've delivered break-even, and then when I read the Audit Scotland reports. Uh, the board and that's from today, well yesterday. The board anticipate an underlying deficit of six million, and then further over in page fourteen, uh, 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 underlying deficit of five point six million. Mm -hmm. So I've got five point six million, I've got six million, yep. and I've got break even. Now, okay. are we talking about? Break even? Are we talking about an underlying deficit of non-recurring? Uh, we're talking or, about. You know, I mean, this this is not clear. We're talking about both. Um, so it's entirely possible to break even but have an underlying deficit. So, for example, if if your income is 100 million a year and your spend expenditure is 110 million pounds a year, then you have a, an underlying deficit of 10 million pounds. But if you made one-off savings of 10 million pounds in that year you've broken even, but you have an underlying uh, deficit. So the position we've ended this year is our in-year position at the end of 2013-14, sorry, 2014-15, is a break-even subject to audit. But, but you've still... managed that break-even yes. by the non-recurring savings. Yes. For example, Correct. Where, where does the six million, if you sold off hospitals or something, where... Well, the, the vast... You know, if you, if, Yep. Give me an example of the non-recurring yep. six million that has allowed you to break even this year, okay. that you will not have that money in future years. The vast majority of those will be on holding post-vacant, so those sort of um, savings are always available to you. So uh, six million of vacancy management? Yes, that's entirely possible on our budget. 
that's entirely possible yes. and still have a quality of service yes. uh, to patients yes. with a six million vacancy management. It wouldn't be the only figure within the six million, but it would be a, a fairly large part of it. Other things would be if you have, say, a new development coming on board, if you delay the start of it, that creates a non-recurring saving as well. So there'd be a whole package of things. But what, what we've done is to try and bring the underlying deficit down where we have vacancies hold, held for long term. We've asked managers to convert those into recurring savings by saying, okay, that post we've managed without it for a year, let's call that, let's take that post out and call it a recurring saving. So we've trans what we've tried to do is ask people to say, don't make non-recurring savings, let's make them recurring now, and that will help with the underlying position. So if you've managed to take out six million, including it seems to be a considerable amount of vacancy management, mm -hmm. are you overstaffed? Can you if you still deliver the same service at the same quality, you've managed to take six million out with vacancies. Does that mean you, oh, well, you were grossly overstaffed? I don't think so. I think this is where managers are managing to hold post vacant for, for a while and, and they knew their financial position, so they're, they're living with that. Some, and the, on, on some of those posts, it has been possible to take those posts out from, from a redesign. It doesn't mean it's an overstaffing. It might be a redesign of services. But some of them, they've said, no, we can't hold that vacancy forever. So they will fill that post. So I wouldn't want you to think we were overstaffed to the tune of £6 billion. Well, it's interesting to know you can hold <laughs> posts vacant with no detrimental impact. So my final uh, question here is uh, to Gary or Elaine uh, Mead. And it's back to the NRAC funding. Um, you've been given uh, a total of uh, 13 million, but 5.5 million in this financial year. If you hadn't had that 5.5 million, would you have had, uh, forget the underlying deficit, would you have been seeking brokerage again? Uh, a range of other things that uh, actions that we would have taken during the year, um, and you know, the, the, the Elaine has explained those in detail at board meetings as to the sort of things that we might have to do. We are very glad that we've been able to get our fair share uh, of funding, and that has allowed us to be able to uh, manage the year-end position a lot more comfortably, and not to make some of the decisions that might have inconvenienced uh, some of our patients. We certainly wouldn't have. Uh, of put safety uh, at, at, at risk, but we would certainly have had to look at things that some people would have found inconvenient and uh, uh, we would not have wanted to have done. So getting our fair share in the year has been very good news for Highland. How's it, if I just go back to Nick Kenton's question, some of the savings that you maybe, mm. you know, had on stream, does this allow you to relax and think, oh, we don't, don't need to bother with that, you know? Uh, we've got an extra 5.5 million, so we don't need to look at efficiency savings. Absolutely not. It's, we are absolutely focused uh, on improving our services. Um, we, we are convinced within NHS Highland that there are numerous places in every part of our operation where there are still efficiencies that we can achieve. And that is always going to be to the benefit of patients. Um, and we, are, we, we run a programme, and we've discussed it with uh, our local MSPs before, around redesign, where we want to eliminate waste, whether it's unnecessary procedures, uh, unnecessary admissions, reducing these admissions. And we think there is a huge scope there but every penny we can get out from these processes will be reinvested in the quality of care that we deliver. And that's what we will be doing. I have no more questions, convener, but I do think it's worth putting on the record that it's not only NHS Highland that has not received its full funding formula. Uh, Grampian and indeed Lothian have faced the same constraints. Uh, I have two brief questions, one from Colin Key and one from Tavis Scott. OK. Um, I Mr. Coots, I suppose this one. Um, are you confident that the non-executive -direct, non directors uh, of the board are aware of their legal responsibilities? Yes, absolutely. I mean, every single non-executive that joins, joins my board uh, undertakes a, a training programme um, and uh, we refresh that training programme as a group. So not only do we want to know that people have been through the training, but we want to do it as a group so that the rest of the colleagues around that table know that everyone else has uh, uh, understood and uh, uh, knows their role and responsibilities. So given that there's a training programme, how do you evaluate 
Uh, well, there's an evaluation of every non-executive every year. Um, there's, so there's a formal evaluation that I conduct with uh, uh, all of the board members, and we discuss areas of where they have contributed well around each of the main aspects of governance, where we believe that they still need some support to be able to improve their performance uh, on certain areas of governance, and we have additional support and training uh, identified where necessary. And that includes uh, looking at what other boards do, uh, looking at other NDPBs do, and you know, looking at best practice. Audit Scotland provide an awful lot of support to non-executives in directing them to areas of questioning, etc., that they should be able to, uh, to, to, to look at. It is a tough job, uh, and they don't get an awful lot of time to do that job. Um, and we try and recruit the best people with the skills that they have, but we want to develop those people when they're in post. Yeah. Cool. yeah thank you. Can I just um, ask a couple? Of, well, one question on, on NRAC again. My understanding of the profiling of the additional funding for NRAC was that it was originally to be three and a half million in 14, 15, and then 11 and a half in 15, 16, and then, as you've just indicated to Mary Scanlon, it changed to five and a half and eight and a half. Why did it change? There, there was a change to the calculations and the formula in year. Um, Mr Kent might be able to give a little bit more detail. So it was a government it. change to the formula rather than your request to, to front load it, shall we say? It, it, it wasn't actually a change in the formula. If you, you're referring to 2014-15, or you're referring to 2014-15, yeah. uh, we began the year with uh, an interim allocation of 2.5 million. That was a movement to target. Towards the end of the year, um, the government received some ex additional um, finite consequential funding and decided to use some of that to move boards who were under target right. towards target. So they uh, um, then allowed another £3 million to be moved um, to NHS Highland to move towards target. So right. money which came, became available towards the end of the year to the government, and that was the government's decision. So it wasn't changing the formula. It was uh, okay. changing the profile of moving us towards target. And how late in the financial year did that arrive? Did you know about that? Obviously, it was a budget consequential from... It, it, from it, London. It was notified to us in January 2015. After the autumn statement in, in yes. December. Yes. Yeah. And you had from January to the end of the financial year, therefore, to spend that additional resource or to use that to offset the deficit, I suppose. Yeah. 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 To, to use it to mitigate the savings mitigate programme. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So just, just before I ask Colin Beatty to come in, just go back to the issue about vacancy management, which you touched on, Mr. Kenton. Uh, can I ask, I mean, would that be something that would be submitted to the board in the form of a paper or a discussion that took place? You know, I, I take it this as a strategy to save money as vacancy management, and is that? No, I think it's, it's a governance it's, issue. And our staff governance committee will be looking at uh, vacancy rates and uh, those issues uh, uh, constantly. I think what is really important to note is... I asked Mr Kenton the I'm question sorry. if we can just confirm that. I, I said that so we would go about this session, so... Just taking you back to your mm -hmm. statement, Mr. Kenton, you stated that, you know, in terms of recurring savings and non-recurring mm -hmm. savings, way of managing this was through vacancy management, so oh, effectively right. not filling posts. Mm -hmm. I take it this is a strategy that's in place. Is that correct? Well, it's routine management to sort yeah. of uh, hold yeah. posts vacant if, if that's feasible. Yeah. So that's so is there a paper, the is there a board paper that's been submitted, or board papers that we could refer to that confirm this approach? Well, as I say, it's routine management, and there will be part of our savings programme, which will be approved by the board, would have assumed some level of vacancy management. So, so would, would you regard that as best practice for us not to fill posts as a way of saving money? And what happens across the whole sector, mm -hmm. I'm not claiming it doesn't. Uh, I've seen it happen in local government. Yes. That, but it's... Is this an example of best practice as a way of saving money? I, I don't think you can... I, I think it's more complicated than that because there'd be a whole, a whole range of reasons why vacancies are not filled. Sometimes they can't be filled because of hard-to-fill posts. So um, I think it well, just depends on the circumstance. To be fair, going back to the question, though, and Mary Scanlon touched on this, mm. you confirmed that a way of saving the £6 million yes. that you referred to quite helpfully is not to fill in certain posts for a certain period of time. Is that correct? That is correct. That's one so way. Of getting, so I actually did hear that properly then. So yes, that is one way. To confirm sense. that, so I take it to save that money. Mm -hmm. Again, we're going back to the way in which the board goes about its business, mm -hmm. for us to ensure that that's taken forward. Sure, there are some paperwork or an audit trail of how we go about that business. Because I take it people don't just say, "Well, I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, I just won't bother filling in that." that vacancy, because that's what I've decided not to. In fact, I would probably guess that probably a number of your heads of departments are desperate to fill in some of these posts, but they've been advised at another level that they're not to fill them in to save money. So all I'm asking for is, could you provide us with the audit trail for that? 
Because it's part of the work that we're doing here that we need that information. So is there an audit trail for that? As I say, it's, it's routine well, you're, you're the Director of Finance, so yes. I would expect you confirm, to confirm the point that you made mm -hmm. in connection with we are now making savings as a result of not filling in vacancies. I, I just take it there must be some kind of trail to confirm that this is the approach that's been taken. There, I don't know why Ms Mead wants to come in or not. There, there, there is a process, but this is something, um, Mr Martin, that, that is practice as... Um, I've not said it isn't. I've just asked... So, so we would not have taken in that financial year a paper to the board to say we are doing this because that's something that we would have done well, as a matter of routine. So no, there would not be a paper other than the papers that we put to the staff governance committee where we monitor clearly um, staff vacancies and they're very aware of us needing to hold or being in, unable to fill some vacancies. So an example might, might be in corporate services. We would um, have a working practice of any vacancies we would expect in corporate services, that's non-frontline services, to be held to, for maybe up to six-month period. And that would then generate some non-recurring savings for us. I think what you've done is you've referred to possibly what could be you know, let's say it's not front line, but still with some impact, but let's, let's yes. refer to that. But there will be front line elements of this, so which is important. But I think the theme for us today, though, is confirming that you are moving forward, you're confident about your financial position. But an element of that is, and just a confirmation from Mr Kenton, that yes, we will have vacancies that we are not filling as a way of saving the money. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Uh, all I'm saying is, we surely should be able, as part of this process that we're following here, there must be something of some kind of audit trail that confirms the approach that's been taken here, and that's all I'm asking. If you tell me there's not, then it's another part of the, the, the whole picture that we have to take into consideration. But I would be really surprised if people were taking decisions not to fill in vacancies if it hadn't, they hadn't received that information or that approach. And if it hadn't been discussed at the board in any context, I'd be surprised as well. But, that, but you might know better than me. So it's been discussed any vacancy control or management at the staff governance committee, which is a subcommittee of the board. Yeah. So the board members would never have, uh, the overall uh, committee of board members, they would never discuss the issue of human resources at any board paper level. They, they would discuss that at the staff governance committee and there are members of, of the board clearly. And do they report to the board they when do. they take decisions? They do, absolutely. So when somebody says, I need to make these savings, then part of the presentation says yes, here are vacancies, we're not going to fill them because that's how we're going to save money. Indeed, that would be part of the discussion. So there may be some board papers or something that we can get access to that can confirm that. That discussion, the, the um, staff governance committee papers are, are available, absolutely. Yeah, so we could. OK. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, actually, I've got two questions, one following on from uh, what the Convener has been talking about just now. Somewhere in these papers it says that you're recruiting three deputy directors, presumably not, not cheap posts to fill, uh, three deputy directors in, or, in order, presumably, to be able to drive through these savings. It doesn't seem... Doesn't seem the, adding to the bureaucrats doesn't seem the right way to affect savings, especially if you've got jobs open elsewhere, which might be... I don't know what they are, but they might be consultants or what, nurses, whatever. What, what's the rationale? Sorry? So who do you want to answer that? Uh, I think possibly Elaine Mead, yeah. Happy to answer that, Mr Beattie. The, um, the references made in the um, updated uh, audit report to the three deputy directors of operation, um, we have in the past taken out a, a significant number and we're required to take out 25% of our senior management um, capacity over over time and we did deliver that um, what we found is that in order to transform services rather than just make small step changes we need to engage the whole expertise of the senior management team to create an environment where people are, are happy to um, change what they're doing right at the front line our view is that our directors of operations, and in the, the north of Highland we have three directors of operations, are fully stretched and 
covering both health and now, of course, social care for two of those areas, and are not able then to um, provide some of the guidance, support, leadership to the local teams to allow them to make the changes that, that they may wish to make. So um, we've discussed that widely. We've discussed that with our union colleagues. We've discussed that um, with our senior managers and our clinical colleagues. And, and the, the view is that actually this is additional capacity which is required in order to be able to unlock the savings and the transformation of services across the rest of Highland. Are they permanent posts? We've made them permanent posts as we wanted to attract high-caliber individuals, but we see those also as um, transitional arrangements. Um, should we find that there are any changes in the current organisational structure, then those may well be transitional posts. So beyond the present cycle of changes and so on that you've got in your, uh, in, in your budget and whatnot, these we people will continue on into the future? So there'll be a, a cost going forward? There, there would be, but at every time there's a vacancy, we'd, we'd reconsider the structure and the position. So um, at the moment, those are absolutely identified as three permanent additional posts, which are, in, in our view, vital to the transformation of the services in NHS Highland. Just moving to my second question, which leads on from what Mary Scannell was talking about, NRAC. Um, Audit Scotland's financial management review, which came out in May 2015 there, um, paragraph 34 there's a statement here that's slightly alarming. It relates to uh, uh, NHS Highland being one of the boards that's been under parity in terms of NRAC and is receiving an increase for 2015-16 of £11.5 million. It then says it was agreed with the Scottish Government in December 2014 to bring forward £3 million of this allocation to help it manage its financial position in 2014-15. And the bit that I'm concerned about and I'd like your comment on is this afforded the board the option of not implementing some of the more challenging areas to deliver savings that could have had a more direct impact on patient services. I would, I would like to you know, understand, has that three million in fact gone to compensating for savings that you would have made or has it actually incrementally improved your situation? Because obviously you should be making savings and the three million should be something extra that you can then use to deliver something additional. Here it seems to be implying, well, it's not implying, it's saying it gives you the option not to. It gave us the option in year not to take some of the more challenging decisions that we may have had to make in order to meet our statutory requirement to break even. So we had a plan and our plan was being executed and we were online to deliver that plan and that's an important point. So we were likely to be able to break even without the assistance, having the additional um, NRAC share that came to us late in the year, that's helped to actually alleviate some of that pressure on us. And in fact, in order to, to make sure we weren't taking resources from frontline services, that's been some of the benefit towards the um, additional posts have been used from the NRAC allocation. But the £3 million compensated for savings you then didn't have to make? Some of that would have, yes, but yeah. not all of that, as we were on target to deliver break-even, even within the, the tight financial constraints that we were experiencing. OK. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Just one question you may, you may be able to clarify for me, uh, Ms Mead. The committee that, that deal, that's actually following on from the convener's uh, line of questioning using um, non-filling of posts, uh, the committee that dealt with that. Now, I'm assuming, although there are, you said that there was um, some board members attached to that, I'm assuming that there would be a report um, given to the full board in formal session as to these decisions uh, being made by that particular committee on that particular issue. And it, would it be, if we went looking for it on the minutes of the board, would we find a report there? Yes, Mr Kerr, you would. So that is a, a formal subcommittee chaired by a, a, a non-executive director and the reports are available and presented to the board at the board meeting. At the board meeting. So they Indeed. are minuted in the full formal board meeting? There, there are... I, they, they are reported to the board meeting. I, we have some um, action points from some of those meetings 
but we do give the full report and the non-executive um, mm -hmm. actually presents any issues by exception at the board meeting. Yeah, I'm just trying to sort of get the idea of who makes the policy decision at the time to make formalise the the the, uh, the actions that have been taken. So these are these are management decisions, Mr. Kerr. So we'll be reporting the action um, to the staff governance committee, and we'll be reporting any consequences of those actions to the the staff governance committee. Yeah. Okay. But j just to be just to be clear, though, that. In terms of Audit Scotland, though, they've made it clear in this, the latest report this month, that non-recurring savings need to be challenged, though, and it's a challenge for your organisation. That's correct, isn't it? It so, is. So we... not filling in these vacancies uh, isn't something that they really want you to continue. They know what happens, but it's not something that they're encouraging, is it? Not it's encouraging, but we would, we would take an, an, an advantage if it was available to us. Um, of holding a position. We look at every vacancy, though, and that's an important point to make, that um, frontline and clinical critical staffing um, affects vacancies... affects staff morale, though, doesn't it? Uh, they're not held, and we do that staff um, partnership is, is a part of our staff governance um, arrangements and sit alongside us at the staff governance committee. So people are, are very aware of the decisions so, so that are being could made. Just clarify, then, you'd never receive any representations from shop stewards or union representatives to say, uh, listen, we need to start filling in these vacancies because it's having an impact on how we deliver our service. We, we meet with them on a monthly basis. They're not raising that as, as a So they're happy with that? They, they understand the, the situation. Yeah. So we are continually... So, for example, with, with nursing staff, we're continually um, attempting to employ and recruit <coughs> nursing staff. So um, this is about frontline staff that we try and secure and, and protect. Um, the position is that if we have other staffing, then we will take an opportunity to, to hold so, those posts wherever we can. Just ask finally, then, just I mentioned the point. Uh, so you, yeah. in your view... The non-filling of the vacancies doesn't affect staff morale. Staff are happy with it. In fact, they have such a good partnership with you that they never raise that as an issue. I staff me, partnership I, I, has not raised that with me with me as an issue. So, in your experience, staff morale is good because we don't fill vacancies that people want to see. I, alongside I don't think them. you can you can make that link immediately. I think oh. that. Uh, I can't think of many organisations where somebody alongside me would say, it's really good that we're doing our job here today. There's a vacancy that's not been filled for the last six months, but it really, it really doesn't matter. You know, most people want to see, if they're part of a workforce, and to make that service more effective, quite like to see vacancies filled, do they not? I mean, of course, that speaks for um, and we attempt to do that, but on occasions we've not been able to do that in some specialties and in some circumstances. Mary Scanlon? Yes, on that point, uh, the paper that we very, got very late from Audit Scotland yesterday uh, talks about your um, sickness absence. The Scottish Government target is 4%, and NHS Ireland has gone up uh, to 4.9%. So you're almost 20, 25% above the Government's target. So... While the convener talks about morale, etc., there's obviously a government target with the NHS throughout the whole of Scotland to have an average sickness level, which, of course, we understand is unavoidable of 4%. Is it possible that the vacancy management, in order to deliver these savings, you know, if you've got a team of 10 and two people are missing because it's not being filled, surely the impact of that workload falls on those who are still there. Have you done any uh, evaluation of the increase in your sickness absence, 20% above the government's target, to see whether there is pressure on staff uh, because of the keeping vacancies open for uh, lengths of time. So we continually assess and report back to, to local management their staff um, vacancies and, and the 
um, sickness rates and they take local action as required to, to manage that. That's also reported to the Staff Governance Committee who, again, in partnership, are looking at any increases in, in staff absence. So, um, yes, we do look at that most carefully and try and reduce wherever we can. So absence. is there an added pressure on the staff who are there to work twice as hard to make up for the vacancy management that you're using, the people who aren't there, uh, you know, in order to make savings, is there additional pressure on the staff who are still there to carry on and continue with the quality of service despite lo uh, reduced numbers of staff? I've certainly seen that in corporate services where we have put pressure on, on non-frontline staff to, to continue. That, that would be fair to say. Um, as I've already said, though, we try and make sure we alleviate where we possibly can pressure on, on frontline staff. If there are posts that we're unable to fill, then um, sometimes we're having to replace those with costly uh, supplementary staff. So, well, that's um, the point, that it does impact on cost savings. Indeed. Are you concerned that your uh, sickness absence is 25% 20 above the government's target? We, we have a number of um, areas that we're looking at that are of concern to us, and certainly we saw a higher than um, an NHS average um, sickness rate in some of the staff groups that came across to us as part of integration. But you don't think it's anything to do with your policy on uh, leaving uh, posts unfilled for no, several months? not directly. Okay. We don't have any further questions. Can I thank you for your time this morning and your previous session as well? Uh, and can I move the committee into private session?